Om Namah Shivaya, everyone. Welcome to our 5 p.m. webinar. It is in two parts. The first part is a publisher's desk entitled A Hindu View of Mindfulness, as you can see on your screen right now. It's the publisher's desk in the coming October issue of Hinduism today, and therefore hasn't been published yet in print or on the web. So you're one of the first to have a look at it, and I hope you enjoy it. I think it's a, it's a very important topic, and the concept of mindfulness is definitely permeating Gurudeva's teachings, though he doesn't use that exact word. Here we go. A Hindu view of mindfulness. Mindfulness, yoga, meditation, as similar as they are, they have important differences. Of them all, mindfulness is in the ascendant in popular culture. Though the others have built up a larger following over time. A Google search yields 1.2 billion hits for yoga. 415 million for meditation. And 207 million for mindfulness. As is commonly known, yoga originated in and is still an integral part of Hinduism Though in today's popular concept, it is a secular practice generally limited to stress reduction and physical health. Originally and still today in India, it had a more profound spiritual role as a comprehensive eightfold discipline known as Raja Yoga. Mindfulness has followed a similar path. With origins in Hinduism, it became a key element in Buddhist meditation. And in today's mainstream culture, it is largely regarded as a non-spiritual practice, fused to support emotion management, reduce stress, and focus the mind. In the Hindu approach, emotional management, stress reduction, and enhanced mental focus are also important goals. However, they are beginning level goals. The Sanskrit term smriti, which means remembering, speaks of the idea of being mindful, remembering ourselves and our relationship with what we are aware of, being present to that. Mindfulness is a preparatory practice for Raja Yoga which lead to, leads to the advanced attainment of higher states of consciousness and ultimately union with the divine as the omnipresent and loving consciousness within us. <clears throat> These mystical states are not part of today's secular definition of mindfulness. An article in the April 5th, 2019 New York Times shows how far mindfulness training has drifted from its Hindu meditative roots. Quote, mindfulness, the practice of using breathing techniques similar to those in meditation to gain focus and reduce distraction is inching into the military in the United States and those of a handful of other nations. This winter, army infantry sold this winter, army infantry soldiers at Schofield Barracks in Hawaii began using mindfulness to improve shooting skills. For instance, focusing on when to pull the trigger amid chaos to avoid unnecessary civilian harm. Unquote. The article goes on to list a few other countries that are also providing this training to their military. What exactly is mindfulness?
The positive psychology program, the Netherlands, offers a terse definition. Mindfulness is attention in the here and now. That's the most important statement in the article, so let me repeat it again. Mindfulness is attention in the here and now. Said another way, it is directing our full attention to what is going on in the present moment without letting the mind think about or be distracted by something else. For example, in performing simple chores, such as making a meal or washing the car, the full mind is on the task. In listening to a friend explain what he or she did yesterday, we focus 100% of our mind on what is being said, not allowing ourselves to think about something else at the same time. While eating a meal, we focus on experiencing the different tastes and textures of each dish. In Gurudeva's teachings, attention is the first step of the progressive mental practices of Raja Yoga, which he defined as attention, concentration, meditation, contemplation, and self-realization. He described attention as holding awareness steady, centralized in only one area of the mind. He said, awareness, he said, attention is awareness poised like a hummingbird over a flower. It doesn't move. The flower doesn't move. And awareness becomes aware of the flower, poised. The entire nerve system of the physical body and the functions of breath have to be at a certain rhythm in order for awareness to remain poised like a hummingbird over a flower. Now, since the physical body and our breath have never really been disciplined in any way, we have to begin by breathing rhythmically and diaphragmatically so that we breathe out the same number of counts as we breathe in. After we do this over a long period of time, and you can start now, then the body becomes trained. The external nerve system becomes trained, responds, and awareness is held at attention. Here's a mindfulness exercise that involves detailed observation of our environment. Take a walk, ideally in nature. Notice every detail that you can about what you see. Perhaps you have had the experience of walking with a young child who spontaneously described details that you hadn't noticed. Young children have keen powers of observation because their intellect is not overactive nor have they accumulated excessive burdens of unresolved past experiences that consume adult minds and memories. We can try to be like children by noticing as many details as possible. The practice of mindfulness is integral to success in meditation. The common experience of those trying to meditate is that thoughts go all over the place, with the meditator unable to quiet them. So instead of meditation being a stilled pond, it is a stormy sea. The ability to control our thoughts can be compared to utilizing a muscle. To make a muscle stronger requires exercising it on a regular basis. The more we use it, the stronger it gets. The ability to control the mind is the same. The more we control our thoughts, the stronger our ability to do so.
If we can control our thoughts during ordinary daily activities, say for eight hours a day, then we have put in a great deal more effort than we do during a 30 minute meditation. 16 times as much exercise. This will definitely accelerate the speed at which we are becoming better at controlling our thoughts. Our definition of mindfulness uses the term here and now to describe the present moment. The past can be described similarly as the there and then, and the future as the where and when. Many individuals habitually spend a significant amount of time thinking about past and future, thoughts that result in no positive benefit. These journeys into the there and then and the where and when are a waste of mental energy and increase our level of worry and stress. Such thoughts are counterproductive to being present in the here and now. Gurudeva gave a helpful practice for reducing these poles to past and future. It's easy to live in the now if you work with yourself a little every day and concentrate on what you are doing each moment. To begin to work toward establishing yourself in the eternal now, first limit time and space by not thinking about or discussing events that happened more than four days past or will happen <clears throat> more than four days in the future. This keeps awareness reined in, focused. Be aware, ask yourself, am I fully aware of myself and what I'm doing right now? He then takes the exercise a step deeper. Once you have gained a little control of awareness in this way, try to sit quietly each day and just be. Don't think. Don't plan, don't remember, just sit and be in the now. It's not as simple as it sounds, for we are accustomed to novelty and constant activity in the mind and not to the simplicity of being. Just sit and be the energy in your spine and head. Feel the simplicity of this energy in every atom of yourself. Think energy, don't think body. Don't think about yesterday or tomorrow, they don't exist, except in your ability to reconstruct the yesterdays and to create the tomorrows, now is the only time. Sitting quietly in the present moment can put us in tune with a deeper part of our nature, our intuition. During such quiet moments, we can have intuitive insights, such as clearly seeing patterns in our life and in the lives of others. For example, we may find that in taking on a new project, we do so with great enthusiasm, but as soon as we encounter the first major obstacle, we become negative and give up. Armed with this insight, we can work to create a new habit of persevering in our endeavors when faced with obstacles. Sitting quietly in touch with our intuitive or soul nature also has the benefit of feeling at peace with ourself, more content with our situation in life, and more accepting of the experiences we are undergoing. Freed of the past, unfazed by the future, we live in the security of the present, the eternal now. Rishi Patanjali in his Yoga Sutras defines yoga as the restraint of mental activities. This is usually thought of as a discipline that applies only during meditation. The concept of mindfulness expands that idea to include restraining our mental activities during our everyday activities.
Clearly, the more mindful we are, the easier it is to quiet the mind during meditation, which will lead to profound experiences of our intuitive soul nature. That concludes our first part, which is our publisher's desk, and we'll be moving on here to Path to Shiva, part seven. First lesson is lesson 39, who are the four great Dhamma saints? The Novars are four saints who lived in Tamil Nadu around 1200 years ago, each composed devotional songs that are sung today in satsangs and temples. Their names are Appar, Sundarar, Sambandar, <clears throat> and Manika Vasagar. All are deeply revered by Tamil Saivites. For those who don't know, the word nalvar, nal means four, and var is a respected person. So the four respected people or four respected saints is what nalvar means. Saint Tirunavakarasa, known as Appar, father, traveled from temple to temple worshiping Shiva. He chose the humblest of work, sweeping the temple walks and weeding the stone courtyards. Nice example in humility. Saint Sundarar is known for his deep visions of Lord Shiva and for several miraculous events that occurred in his life. A poor man, he often prayed for money or food for his family. His prayers were always answered. The third saint, Sambandar, was just three years old when he was blessed with the vision of Lord Shiva, after which he spontaneously sang his first song. He traveled throughout South India, sometimes with Appar, his elder, singing the praises of Shiva. At age 16, his family arranged for him to be married, but this was not to be. He was so devoted to Shiva that just before the wedding, he disappeared into the sanctum of Turu Naluperuman, Shiva temple near Chidambaram, and was never seen again. Songs of the first three saints are called Devarams. And we have the fourth. Manika Vasagar, the fourth Nalvar, was prime minister to the Pandian king of Madurai. One day he was blessed with enlightenment and a vision of Lord Shiva sitting under a banyan tree. After this, he left the royal court and traveled about composing songs and building a temple for Shiva at Turu Perundurai. His poems stress the importance of the Nama Shivaya mantra developing dispassion and cultivating love of Lord Shiva. His highly poetic hymns are found in two collections, Tiruvasagam and Tirukovayar. Tiruvasagam is a much more popular one. Then we hit the questions. Oh, the questions are very simple. We really don't need to look at them. There's nothing philosophical there. They're just trying to encourage the student to memorize the four names, a few basic biographical facts about each of the Nalvar, and to know the difference between Devaram and Tiruvasagam Tirukovayar, who composed which. So we'll just skip through that to save a little time.
Lesson 40, what is our code of conduct? The yamas and niyamas are the code of conduct. Heeding the 10 yamas or restraints keeps our instinctive nature in check. Well, that's very important. It's <clears throat> want to make sure we were clear on understanding the difference between the yamas and niyamas we can lump them all together but they're of, of two different and very distinct natures the yamas are a restraint and what are they restraining they're controlling our instincts such as the tendency to eat too much by exercising the yama of mitahara we're controlling that instinctive tendency within us so it doesn't express itself without restraint abiding by the ten niyamas observances makes us more religious and cultured re revealing our refined soul nature so quite different we're not restraining anything here we're not dealing with the instincts it's more we're expressing the refinements within us. The cultural and religious refinements are being expressed or observed. And that's only possible when the yamas are under a certain degree of control. Otherwise, we're always kind of seriously disturbed about one thing or another. Yamas and niyamas provide the foundation to support our yoga practice and sustain us from day to day and year to year on the path to Shiva. So this is an actual book. I chopped off the author's name at the bottom. But you can see <clears throat> it perfectly goes along with our statement, which was made before we found the cover of the book. Yamas and niyamas provide the foundation. So they agree. Yamas and, yama and niyama, foundations for spiritual life. In fact, there's a number of titles on Amazon.com on the Yamas and Niyamas and on yoga, which present the Yamas and Niyamas as a foundation for spiritual life. So it's a widely agreed upon concept. What this foundation means, it means the more advanced practices won't be fruitful unless these two areas of practice, Yama and Niyama, are pretty much going along as they should be. Then we get into the actual yamas. I won't bother to read the written definition, just comment on it. Ahimsa, non injury. When it comes to the idea of restraining injury, of course, naturally, we think about physical injury. It's the most obvious and usually all, and in many instances, all is thought about. However, the definition is threefold. Do not harm others by what you do, say, or think. Another way of saying that is deed, word, and thought. And my experience is individuals that I generally deal with are refined enough not to be injuring people by hitting them, but they do still injure people by their words, particularly when they get upset with them. We, we lash out with our words and we hurt others. So this is enjoining us to restrain from that as well. And once we're good at not hurting others through our words, then it comes down to not hurting others through our thoughts. We can be brooding about someone all throughout the day and sending them negative thoughts, injurious thoughts, and even that is something that we should restrain, not do. But we move on one at a time, action, speech, thought. Truthfulness, 
Lots of times it relates to dishonesty or honesty, I guess we should say. Falsehood relates to dishonesty. And sometimes individuals have them confused. Well, honesty, dishonesty has to do with what we do. In other words, we cheat on a test, that's being dishonest. And then we lie about it, that's being untruthful. So quite often it happens in that order. There's a dishonest act, we do something we shouldn't do, we do something we're trying to cover up, and then our speech is untruthful as a result. So we need to restrain the action we're doing that we shouldn't be doing as well as lying about it. Non-stealing. As an adult, we tend to steal in subtle ways, excuse me, cheating on our income taxes, etc. And it relates to not being satisfied with what we have, trying to get more than easily comes to us. So if we can restrain that desire to have more than what we really are capable of having, then naturally non-stealing falls away. Divine conduct means sexual purity, it's present in all religions and is self-evident. Patience, patience has to do with, impatience, shall we say, has to do with not being able to accept the pace at which things are happening, our interrelations with another person, our experience at an airport, Something is moving way too slowly and we're not able to accept that fact and kind of slow down and fit into the time frame that we're presented with. So being flexible enough to do that slow down, fit into the time frame and find a positive way of utilizing it is the idea of patience. Steadfastness, of course, sticking to something. One of the reasons for not being steadfast is we take up an activity without giving it good thought, taking it up because a friend is doing it, it's an emotional whim, it's just not well thought through, and after a while, we lose interest. So the key, one of the keys to being steadfast is to only take things up after a good reflection on the nature of what it is, and if we really want to, pursue it and be successful at it. Compassion, daya, being sensitive to how other people feel, we have to kind of reach out, if we're not used to doing that, reach out and try and feel as they feel. Develop a sense of compassion, and when we're able to do that, then we're better at uh, interacting with them in a way that encourages them and doesn't further discourage them. Honesty, we talked about already. Mitahara, moderate appetite. The self-evident aspect of it is don't eat too much, <laughs> which is the first line of the definition. But Gurudeva's definition expands it to being vegetarian. Don't eat meat, fish, shellfish, fowl, or eggs. And yes, eggs are a non-veg food, no matter what form they're in. And then he expands it even further by saying, eat wholesome foods, avoiding junk foods, and definitely avoid over-processed over foods such as white sugar, white rice, and white flour. I remember that idea came out, white, no white sugar, white rice, and white flour about 30 years ago, Gurudeva first introduced that, I believe, and it was very unpopular. But nowadays, it's, it's kind of mainstream, and more and more people realize the devastating effects that eating lots of white sugar, white rice, and white flour has on our health, such as diabetes, and are following it naturally. They know they need to do that to stay healthy. So it's come around. It's now seeing its uh, time in the sun. Purity, same idea as 
non-injury, body, speech, and mind, which starts with the very basics of washing the body, clean clothes, clean environment, no swearing in our speech, and then nothing going on in our mind that shouldn't be there. So again, when we start with the gross, then the subtle aspects become easier. Then we get to the niyamas. A sensitivity to remorse is important. And for those who are parents, it's important to create an environment where the children don't feel threatened if they admit to having done something they shouldn't have. Of course, they should receive an appropriate discipline, but they don't, they're not totally fearful of sharing what they did. It's very helpful. Contentment. Contentment's very simple, that we're happy with what we have. Dawn of giving, very important in this time, in, as in, I'd say, all countries I'm aware of, there's an overemphasis on materialism, on acquiring possessions. It's a major motivation in many people's lives to acquire bigger house, more cars, more this, nicer vacations, and all of that is fine. We're not trying to criticize that, that's part of family life, is to have nice things, but we need to balance it out by giving. Otherwise, we get too greedy and too too materialistic. So we balance those tendencies out by making sure we give a portion to charity on a regular basis. Faith is on many levels. You could do a whole hour on faith. But the simplest one is to believe in the scriptures, believe in the testimonies of great souls as to their experiences of God Shiva, other gods, meditation, and so forth. We don't challenge that. We accept it and work with it. Ishvara Pujana, worship of Shiva. So in our tradition, Worshiping regularly at the temple <clears throat> is only the first step. Once we get good at that and are experiencing positive blessings from the temple, then at some point we should start doing our own puja in the home shrine. Taking it on in a more active way, and that's the idea of Ishvara Puja now. Scriptural listening, of course, this is the idea of learning from scripture, but specific, specifically shravana, listening. In other words, we can get much more out of material if we hear the person who experienced it speak it. Then the words really pierce us in their depth and we're able to understand them in much greater, much greater way. Mati, cognition, means awakening our intuition, which the guru helps us do. Vrata, <clears throat> taking vows. Probably the most famous one in our tradition is Taipusam, Kavadi Vrata, that's kind of an obvious one, very major. Monthly ones could be fasting on Pradosha, yearly Skandashashti. So these are extra efforts made for just a couple of days or even one day with having in mind the idea of greater purification. We're putting more into the practice and we're hoping to get more out of it in the form of greater purification. If someone asks you, why do we carry cavity? It's to purify ourselves. Very simple answer. Japa, self-evident. Ideally, it's done daily on our mantra on Japa beads. 
austerity. Vrata is a type of austerity, but there's many others. And they, again, are just for the purpose of greater purification, such as the whole family could skip a meal and give the money saved to a charity. That's a very nice way to involve the kids, it's just one meal. <clears throat> and it gets them in the habit of self-denial. Then we get to the questions. These are worthwhile looking at. So here we're just wanting to make sure that the idea of yamas being restraints and niyamas being observances, it's clear that they're different. That which provides the foundation, yamas, niyamas, niyamas, this is pointing out that it's both. We need both practices in place to have a, a really solid foundation for more advanced practices. Oh, so then this is just a definition of ahimsa. Tithe and donate, making sure they know the Sanskrit word dana. Worship and meditate daily. Ishvara pujana. Simple. What are our five core practices? <clears throat> Excuse me for a minute. How are we doing on time here? Pretty good. Five core practices are a very important part of Guru Deva's teachings. They're what he encourages all Hindus to do. Kind of a fundamental level of a basic practice that's sustainable without putting a lot of effort into it. Worship, holy days, pilgrimage, dharma, and rites of passage are the five areas of practice that Gurudeva recommended for all Hindus. Sanskrit, they are called pancha, nitya, karmas. So pancha, of course, is five in Sanskrit, like pancha ganapati. Nitya means permanent. So the puja in the temple, the daily puja is called Nitya Puja. Karmas in this context means action. So five permanent actions. You could translate it as, then we get the Sanskrit. Upasana. First and foremost is daily worship, upasana. This is the core of religious life, the soul's natural outpouring of love for God and the gods. Next is utsava, honoring holy days, when the blessings of the deities are strongest. We join with family and community in ceremony and feasting during the major Shiva, Ganesha, and Murugan festivals each year. Monday is a Hindu holy day in the north of India and Friday in the south. On this day, we attend the temple, clean and decorate the home shrine, and spend extra time in prayer, japa, and scriptural study. These are not days of rest. We carry on our usual work. The idea is that we have one day a week. It's always the same day when when we as an individual or we as a family go to the temple. That's what's being encouraged. And it can be any day, Monday and Friday are two suggestions here, but it can also depend on 
what activities at the temple are the ones we can relate to most. Pilgrimage, Tirtha Yatra, is our third area of practice. At least once a year, we make a special journey to a holy place. It is a complete break from our usual concerns during which God, gods, and gurus become the singular focus. And of course, the reason for that is, even though we worship at a temple every week, when we go on pilgrimage, because we've set our normal responsibilities aside for at least a day and hopefully longer, we're able to focus more intently on worship and therefore get more benefits out of the practice. These three forms of worship, daily puja, holy days, and pilgrimage, help us manifest our inner perfection in our outer nature. Our fourth area is dharma. Living an unselfish life of duty and good conduct. Here the yamas and niyamas are our guide. Dharma includes being respectful of parents, elders, teachers, and swamis. Our fifth area of practice is rites of passage called samskaras. English, we could say sacraments. These are personal ceremonies that sanctify and celebrate crucial junctures in life from birth to death. The first major samskar is the name giving rite. Others follow, including first feeding, ear piercing, and beginning of formal study. As an adult, the most important ceremony is marriage. At death, the soul is released from the body during sacred funeral rites. Rites of passage draw to us special blessings from the devas and deities, society and village, family and friends. Then we get to questions. Five core practices are called in Sanskrit, pancha karmas, nicha karmas, pancha nicha karmas. Of course, it's C, it's just stress, stressing that, make sure we under, understood it to have three words. Then we get, these are on the next page, Utsava, Dharma, Upasana, Samskara, Tirtiyatra. So just the definition of each, Upasana, daily worship, holy days, Utsava, pilgrimage, Tirtiyatra, living an unselfish life of duty and good conduct, Dharma and rites of passage, Samskara. Practice of Utsava includes attending temple festivals, attending the temple on your weekly holy day, or both. So, of course, it's both. In our definition of Utsav, it's both the festivals and then once a week on the holy day. Ideally, the same day. Ideal frequency of pilgrimages, C, at least once a year. And it doesn't have to be to a foreign country. It can just be to a temple at a distance in your own country from where you live and where you normally don't go. It's good that it's a temple that you don't visit other times of the year. Three forms of worship mentioned above help us manifest our outer perfection in our inner nature. And of course, that's backwards. <clears throat> so it's false. It's our inner perfection in our outer nature. Trick question. How do we use affirmations? An affirmation is a positive declaration or assertion that we repeat regularly to bring about useful changes in our life. While repeating the words, we concentrate on the meaning and visualize and feel the desired result. Threefold, very important. 
We need to do all three of these in order for the affirmation to fully manifest. Concentrate on the meaning, visualize, and feel. So that'll be explained a little bit more in the coming slides. Your words, visualizations, and feelings have power. How do they have power? By impressing your subconscious mind. When they are positive, useful, and creative, they make you more secure and successful in everything you do. Affirmations must be carefully worded to gain the desired effect. The sadhana is to repeat it to yourself for a minute or two, ideally at the same time each day. Silently is good, but aloud is even better. For example, I can, I will, I am able to accomplish what I plan. Repeating this each day programs your mind with confidence and increases your willpower. But just saying the words is not enough. You must really feel, I can, I will, I am able. Imagine what it will feel like when you have accomplished your goal. It is helpful to remember the feeling of success you experienced when you achieved something in the past. That's something I mention to students when they say I'm not secure about this big exam I'm facing. A lot of pressure. I say, Remember something in your past at which you were very successful. Remember the feeling it gave you at that time and experience that feeling right now. So it's in there in the subconscious, the idea of success. So we just need to find it and then relive it. And that helps us be more confident in the present. Positive affirmations help you face life with optimism. Negative thinking does the opposite. Many people think, I can't, I won't, I'm not able. And sure enough, they fail. Why? Because they have programmed their mind to fail. An affirmation creates the opposite effect. You see the goal clearly and feel yourself attaining it. Success follows naturally. <clears throat> Gurudeva's other affirmations include, I'm all right right now. All my needs will always be met. I am equal to any challenge I meet. Affirmation builds a positive self-concept. This means knowing that you are a worthy person deserving a wonderful life, and fully capable of achieving it. Having such a positive concept allows us to identify with our inner spiritual nature so that we truly feel we are a divine being on a perfect path. Oh, that's an important point there. Stress it for a moment. Gurudeva starts out <clears throat> in Dancing with Shiva, you are a divine being. And following that pattern, Path to Shiva starts out in the same way. Unfortunately, some people have a negative self-concept because of criticism from parents, criticism from teachers, experiences in growing up. It was not possible to jump from a negative self-concept to a divine self-concept. We need to move through the stage of a positive self-concept. So anyone who has a negative self-concept needs to make it positive through affirmations. And then when there's a strong positive self-concept can move on to a divine self-concept of being the soul. As Yogaswami said, ni atma, very simple. You are the soul. Affirmation, positive declaration, or assertion, and repeat regularly. 
useful change is true. While repeating the words, what do we do? So this is pointing out there's three possible things that we do. Concentrate on the meeting, visualize, and feel the desired result. And we should do all three, which is answer B, in order for the affirmation to fully manifest. Check the statement below that is not an affirmation. Of course, it's B. I can't, I won't, I'm not able. And then we talked about this to imagine what it will feel like when you have accomplished your goal. Remember the feeling of success you experienced when you achieved something in the past. That's the best way to <clears throat> have a successful feeling. Affirmation builds a negative self-concept, which then allows us to identify with our inner spiritual nature. Of course, that's false. It builds a positive self-concept. What is sadhana? There are three dimensions to our being, physical, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual. All three need attention for optimum health. Exercise strengthens our physical body. Learning and practicing self-control expands and enhances our emotional, mental capacity. Through sadhana, spiritual practice, we exercise our spiritual nature by taking time to experience it. Most of the time, we are so wrapped up in our outer nature that we are hardly aware of our deep, glorious inner reality. This can go on life after life, as many people only begin to think of greater realities when nearing the point of death. We give time to our spiritual nature by performing religious activities, ideally as a daily vigil or spiritual exercise. During this quiet time alone, we focus on life's inner purpose, which is to make spiritual progress. Puja, japa, scriptural study, hatha yoga, and meditation are all forms of sadhana. Some sadhanas are yearly, such as going on pilgrimage. Some may be assigned by the guru as a one-time practice. A popular sadhana is chanting Om 108 times each day. The 10 minute spiritual workout is becoming popular in today's busy world. That's the how it looks on a smartphone. And we have a number of people who enjoy doing a daily, short daily vigil of 10 minutes by utilizing that application. It's a good way to get started. <clears throat> These times of quiet retreat from life's hustle and bustle are underrated. Their benefits overlooked. Sadhana builds willpower, faith and confidence in oneself and in God, gods, and guru. It harnesses our instinctive intellectual nature, allowing unfoldment to the superconscious realizations and innate abilities of the soul. Gurudeva notes, through sadhana, we learn to control the energies of the body and nerve system. And we experience that through the control of the breath, the mind becomes peaceful. Sadhana is practiced in the home, in the forest, by a flowing river, under a favorite tree. In the temple, in gurukulas, or wherever a pure, serene atmosphere can be found. And we have Yoga Swami. Yoga Swami directed his devotees to follow the sadhana marga, the path of religious effort, all through life. Well, sadhana is a more demanding practice than the pancha nicha karmas. Because it's hard to do something every day. It's hard to 
get to bed early and get up early every day and do it, but it's something we encourage people to do if they're serious, if they're really serious about making spiritual progress. Because having sadhana as one of your basic practices allows you to move forward faster in spiritual unfoldment. So to save a little time, we'll move through these questions. They're not crucial. And we come to what is yoga. <clears throat> Yoga means union. It is Hinduism's system of yoking individual consciousness with transcendent or divine consciousness. So we're bringing two things together. When we, when we, when we bring them together, they become one. Our individual consciousness is no longer individual. It's universal. It becomes a divine consciousness. Yoga was described by sage Patanjali in his Yoga Sutras over 2,000 years ago as a system of meditation with eight limbs or stages. Hence, it is known as Ashtanga, Eightfold Yoga. It's also known as Raja Yoga. Ashta means eight in Sanskrit. Anga means limbs. So put them together. Ashtanga means eight-limbed. The Eight-Limbed Yoga. As we mentioned earlier in the pub desk, Patanjali defined yoga as the restraint of mental activities. Crucial definition. So we've been through stages one and two, yama, niyama, asana is just posture, Pranayama is regulated breathing, which applies even in mindfulness. Prachahara is sense withdrawal. We can see that in the two turtles there. The one on the left is normal and the one on the right is withdrawn. So taking the energy and drawing it in. It's like consciously being asleep. We're drawing in the energy. Dharana concentration, dhyana Meditation and samadhi is ecstasy or a, a oneness. Those are the eight limbs. Over time, specialized forms of yoga have been developed. For example, Kriya Yoga focuses on breath control, mantra and mudra. Karma Yoga transforms work into worship. Bhakti Yoga is union through devotion and in some forms of Hatha Yoga, bodily perfection is the goal. <clears throat> the point here is the word yoga can have many different meanings and to clarify what exactly it means it's helpful to have a word in front hatha yoga bhakti yoga karma yoga the word yoga in its you could say secular usage i teach yoga we have yoga classes in town would actually be clearer if we said hatha yoga, bodily postures, because they're not teaching the full eight limbs of Patanjali's yoga system. They're focusing on hatha yoga generally for stress reduction and health benefits. And that's good. You know, traditional Hinduism believes in that too, but those are only, as we mentioned in the pub desk, the beginning goals. We don't want to stop at the beginner's level. Questions we will skip for the sake of finishing on time. There's nothing important there. Thank you very much for listening. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Om Namah Shivaya. <clears throat>